welcome to introduction to civil engineering subject. So this is for the first year, that is for first semester or second semester. This is an optional open elective and this is being given by the Department of Civil Engineering and the course code is 22 ESC 141 slash 242 and this has four hours of teaching per week. Two hours is teaching and the other two hours is tutorial and the total number of hours that is pedagogy is 50 hours that is 25 hours for teaching and the remaining 25 hours for tutorial. So total in the total marks will be 100 and out of which 50 marks for continuous internal evaluation and the remaining 50 marks for semester and examination. Okay, and those two numbers will be added and the result will be declared for 100. So as usual, this subject has five modules. So before going into the details of the modules, so let me say, let me see what we have as course objectives. So as per the VTU, so they have given us five course objectives. So the first one being to make students learn the scope of various specialization of engineering. To make students learn or we can say to make students aware of the various specialization of civil engineering. That is one of the course objectives. And the second one being to make students learn the concepts of sustainable infrastructure and to develop students, going to the next one, to develop students' ability to analyze the problems involving forces, moments with their application. Fourth one being to develop the students' ability to find out the center of gravity and moment of inertia and their applications. And the fifth one, to make the students learn about kinematics. Okay, as I said, in total, we have five modules, and in the examination, each module carries equal marks, and there will be internal choice for the questions. Finally, what are the course outcomes? So again, as per VTU, we have five COs, that is five course outcomes. The first one is understand the various disciplines of civil engineering. Okay, various disciplines we are going to discuss in detail once I start explaining. And the second course outcome being understand the infrastructure requirement for sustainable development. CO3 is, that is, course outcome 3 is, compute the resultant and equilibrium of four systems. And the fourth one is, locate the centroid of plane and built up sections. And the last one, compute the moment of inertia of plane and built up sections. So these are the course outcomes as per the VTU. So in module 1, under introduction to civil engineering, we study different branches of civil engineering. So let me write down what are the different branches of civil engineering. So one is surveying. Second one is structural engineering. Structural engineering, geotechnical engineering, hydraulics and water resources engineering, Transportation Engineering, Transportation 
environmental engineering. And the last one is con construction planning. And management, project management. See, to start with, what is civil engineering? As the name itself suggests, it takes care of the civilian needs, that is, needs of the people. What are the basic needs of the people? Water, shelter, are the basic needs of the people. And civil engineering takes care of all those things. This is the way the civil engineering started. Okay? And we have, and actually civil engineering is the oldest branch in engineering. So as time passed, civil engineering divided into several, several specializations like this. And also as science advanced, so civil engineering divided further. So these are the different branches of civil engineering, main branches of civil engineering. So, and the first one is surveying, the second one is structural engineering, third one geotechnical engineering, then hydraulics and water resources engineering, transportation engineering and, uh, and highway engineering, environmental engineering and construction planning and project management is the last one. So, coming to the surveying, see what is surveying? Surveying is nothing but finding out the relative positions of different points on the surface of the earth. That is basically the surveying. So what are, when we say the positions of different points, we say in engineering as RLs or reduced levels. So they will be, they will be having some numbers. So when we, when we have some numbers, we are measuring the location or height of those points with respect to certain datum or with respect to certain reference points and that reference point is located Karachi in Pakistan. So there, the, that reference point with zero RL or with zero reduced level is located and established by Britishers in Karachi before independence. So when we say the RL or reduced level of a point is say 1700.950 meter, that means the height of that particular point with reference to the datum located at Karachi is that much of meter. That is higher than that point, reference point. So, so why do we need all those things? See, when you, whenever we are constructing a building, a dam, or any civil engineering related structures, the first thing we are going to do is to conduct survey. So to, by conducting survey, we'll know the topography of the land. Say for example, we are constructing a reservoir, a dam for example, then on one side it is going to be a reservoir. So what do we do? Again, we conduct survey, okay, and after conducting the survey, we are going to locate a different locations to build a dam, okay. After so many studies, will come to one particular point wherein we are going to construct a dam. So to decide that we need to do survey. So that is we need to know the topography, if at all we are constructing a dam in a particular place, what is the length of the dam, what is the condition of the soil, okay, and how much storage we can have on the upstream side to store the water and how much water can be stored. So all those things can be estimated first by conducting survey, okay? Then after conducting survey, once everything is done, then what we are going to do is, we are going to decide what is the length of the dam required, how much foundation depth we need, 
what is the width and what is the height. That way we can estimate what is the material required and how many days it takes to complete a project, okay, how much, what labor requirement. So to do all these things, we start with the survey work. Okay, in survey we have two types. So before that, I would like to add one more thing. This is not just for dam construction alone. This is one of the examples. So even for a small building, even if you are constructing a small building or residential houses, even you do measurement and locate the points when you dig out the foundation, so the depth of the foundation may not be the same in all points. Again, that depends on the topography of the site where you are going to construct a building. If it is not level, even if it is inclined, so normally what we do is we make sure the foundation level is at the same level when once we take out the soil. So once the foundation level is at the same level, then when it comes to taking out the soil, it is going to be different. The quantity of soil to be taken out is going to be different from place to place within a site. Okay, so that is estimated, that is done by conducting surveys. So that is one more thing. And under survey, we are, mainly we have two types. So one is plane surveying and the other is geodetic surveying. So what is plane surveying and what is geodetic surveying? Basically, earth is a curved object. It is not flat. It is a curve, elliptical shape. Okay. And when we are conducting survey, plane surveying, we can conduct up to 260 square kilometers by assuming the land as flat. So even though it is not flat, it is curved. So we are going to ignore the curvature of the earth up to a up to an area of 260 square kilometers. So whatever survey do, we do until that point, we are going to call that survey as plane survey. What is geodetic survey? Then when the area goes beyond 260 square kilometers, so then we are going to take into consideration the curvature of the earth. If you don't consider then the, uh, whatever survey you do, the result or the values you are going to get will be erroneous, okay? By, then by applying correction and all those things, so we can correct those readings, but the thing is, so beyond 260 square kilometers, it is considered as geodetic surveying. So we are going to conduct geodetic surveying using satellites, that is a advanced, this technology we have now, so there is to be survey using aeroplanes, that is called aerial surveying. When it comes to plane surveying, okay, which we do for smaller areas, so we are going to use different instruments to conduct surveys starting from simple chain, simple tape, up to different, some sophisticated instruments. So we are going to use different instruments like you know, dumpy level, theodolite, total station, okay, these are the main things and also some accessories to help or to support these advanced instruments, okay. And this is what we study in surveying mainly. And when it comes to, again, surveying just when we are constructing dams, not only dams, we are constructing other marine structures. Again, when we are constructing canals, constructing buildings, all those things. So before doing anything, just we are going to conduct survey. It is, survey is not simple measuring distance. No, it is well beyond that. Okay, with that, I'm going to end discussion on surveying. Let me go with the next branch, structural engineering. So structural engineering, what is structural engineering? Again, if you take, I'm going to start with a simple building, residential building. Okay, when you have a residential building, so once you build a 
residential building. So that building will have some weight because of the made, weight of the material, what we call it as self-weight, and some dead, dead loads and some live loads. Live loads are nothing but temporary loads. Human beings are live loads. Okay, in a building, they are going to be there for some time, then they will go away. Okay, so these are the loads. Finally, those loads will be transferred to the soil. And to withstand those loads, so what we have to do is, we have to construct structures in such a way that those structures should be able to withstand the loads coming on that particular structure, including the self weight of the structure. As I said, for example, if I take any residential building, especially a framed structure, what are the different elements of a frame structure? Beams, slabs, columns, footings, these are the main elements of a structure. And whatever the load coming on the structure will be transferred to the soil through these elements. Load travels from the point we apply on the structure at any point finally to the soil through the foundation. Okay. So in structural engineering, we have two parts. One is analysis part and the other is design part. So in the analysis part, what we do is when a structure is subjected to different loading conditions, so it is going to create or it is going to generate what we call bending moment, shear force, and also it is going to create deformation, everything. So mainly due to the bending moment and shear force and also torsion, there is going to be internal stresses developed in the material of the structure. So what we have to do is to withstand those stresses or what we do is we are going to provide the materials in such a way that those materials we are going to provide should be able to withstand the stress caused due to the load coming on the structure. So what are the materials we are going to use? We are going to use concrete, steel, in case of RCC structures, in case of masonry structures, load gets transferred through bricks to the foundation. When it comes to steel structures, again, all those elements, structural elements, are made of steel sections like I sections, L sections, angles, etc. Okay, as I said, so we have two parts, analysis and the design part. So what do we do under analysis? So first, as per the codal recommendation, we have more than 500 code books in civil engineering. So there are only a few codes we use regularly. One of the codes is IS-875. This has five parts. So part one deals with the dead load. Part 2 deals with the live load, and then part 3 is wind load, next snow load, and the last one is different loads and load combinations. So mainly we are going to use part 1 and part 2. So part 1, dead load. What do we get? So what are the unit weights of different materials? What is the unit weight of brick? If you take one cubic meter of brick, how much it weighs? And if it is concrete, pure concrete, one cubic meter of concrete, what is the weight of that? If you take one cubic meter of, meter of RCC, what is the weight? If you are using some wood material, depending on the species of wood, it will have a different value, different unit weight. Okay? So all those things, things are covered in part one of the code book. So that is mainly related to the dead load. When it comes to the live load, another name for live load we are going to use nowadays is the imposed load. So the code says imposed load for, say, residential building. What is the load? Say, for example, they may say, okay, here it is 2 kilonewton per meter square. That means if you consider 1 meter by 1 meter area, so there is going to be a load of 2 kilonewton. If it is a residential building, same residential building, if it is a balcony where the traffic is a little bit more than 
what is the traffic inside a room, then we may have to consider a little bit higher load. And if you go to a hospital, so again, the load will be more because it is a public building. Again, if you go to a marketplace, again, the loads will be different. So depending on which building you are constructing, depending on where you are constructing, we are going to consider different live load values. So once we, once we have those values, so what we do is, we go to the analysis part. First, we are going to prepare plan for a particular structure which we are going to build. So after preparing the plan, we are going to locate what are the column positions, beam positions, so and all those things. Nowadays, we are going to make use of some software or else you can do manually, but it is a little bit time consuming. But when you use software, then we are going to apply those loads, dead load, live load, and combinations of different loads, and we are going to find out what are the moments developed, what are the torsional forces developed, what are the shear forces developed, so what are the deformation values, that is deflection and sway, if at all it is there, then all those things we are going to determine using the software. Then, once we have those things, analysis part is over. Next, we are going to go for design part. In the design part, what we do is, we are going to fix the dimensions of all those structural elements. So as I said, in a building, the different structural elements are slabs, beams, columns, foundations. Say for example, if I take a beam, so first we are going to fix what are the dimensions of the beam we need based on some codal recommendations. Codal recommendations, we have different, as I said, different IS codes, Indian Standard codes. So to fix those dimensions of a beam, then they have some recommendations we follow and we are going to fix the dimensions. So once that is done, we know the unit weight from part one of I, IS-875, we know the dimensions so that we can calculate what is the dead load of the beam. On that beam, we are going to get the slab, we are going to cast the slab on it. Even the slab will have some weight. We are going to take that into account while doing analysis. Again, on the slab, we are going to put different kinds of floors. So, it may be granite, it may be red oxide, it may be vitrified tiles. Then afterwards, we are going to put partition walls, even they have weight. So all those things we are going to take into account for the analysis part. Okay, once we determine the moments and shear forces developed, if it is an RCC structure, Knowing the depth and width, we are going to find out what are the steel requirement, that is how much steel you need, that is the reinforcing bars. So we are going to find out, okay, through the design, that comes under design part. Afterwards, to take care of shear, we have to provide stirrups. What are the stirrups we are going to provide? What diameter are stirrups? how many legs of stirrups, what is the spacing of stirrups. So all those things we are going to do in the design part. So in addition to that, we are going to check for deflection. So any structure, if, if you take, is bound to deflect. Say for example, if I take a beam, again it has deflected under the self-weight and also under live load. So it is not visible for naked eyes. Just because it is not visible, it does not mean that it has not deflected. Only rigid material cannot deflect. But there is no material which is rigid on, the, on this face of this earth. Okay, so it is bound to deflect. Then we are going to find out what is the deflection. Then we have to make sure that the deflection we get is within certain limits so, where is the limit set? It is set by the IS code. So, we are going to check what is the standard maximum deflection allowed 
for that particular structural element. Okay, and we are going to find out what is the actual deflection. We have to make sure that the actual deflection is less than what is maximum allowed. Then only we can say, okay, it is good. So just because the deflection is excess, it does not mean that the structure is going to fail. The defle even though def the deflection is more, so the structure can stand, but it is not going to be serviceable or livable because of excess deflection and also it causes some psychological feeling among common people to live in that area. Okay. F again, finally, the load gets transferred to the columns. Again, how much load the col a column gets? Okay, as a result, what is the moment to which a column is subjected to and also what is the actual load it is going to be subjected to? So those two combinations to withstand, then we have to provide, again, proper dimensions of the column, then proper reinforcement, proper lateral ties, and all those things. Again, when we come to this lab, yes, same thing we apply. We apply load, we take into consideration all the dead load and live load, or imposed load, then we are going to design so in the design, we are going to find out what is the thickness required, what is the slab thickness required. So what are the reinforcements we need, what are the diameters of the reinforcements, and at what spacing we need to provide those reinforcements, then at the end how to tie those reinforcements. So all those things we are going to do in design. Okay, just I have taken only two elements for discussion, two or three elements like beam, slab, and uh, columns, but similarly we can have, we can design so many other structural require, structural elements depending on where we get and <clears throat> with that I am going to end with RCC and when it comes to steel, same, analysis remains the same. When it comes to steel structure, so we are not providing any reinforced concrete over there we are going to construct a structure using only steel sections. So we have different sections of steel, I section, L section, angle sections, instead of saying L, we can say angle sections, channel sections, T sections, so tubes, we use normally in trusses. So all those things we are going to use in case of steel structures. Again, in, when it comes to design, so we are going to find out what are the different sections we need and all those things. Okay, that comes under structural design. Okay, so in case of bridges, bridge is also a structure. We can construct RC, RC bridge, that is reinforced concrete bridge, or we can build steel bridge or we can build combination of these two called composite bridge, okay? And a bridge is subjected to different loading conditions. So different loading conditions, that is vehicle loads, truck loads, truck is a vehicle of course. So again, if you go to the borders where we have military, it is going to be subjected to the loads of tanks, heavy trucks and all those things. So when we are designing a bridge, we are going to take all these loads into consideration, including the self weight of the members or self weight of the bridge. Okay? So that comes under analysis and design of a bridge. For analysis and design, we are going to make use of the recommendations given under IRC, that is Indian Roads Congress. So as per that, we are going to do analysis and design of bridges. So that is the brief introduction of what is structural engineering, okay? In structural engineering, we are also, we also, one more thing I would like to add. In structural enge engineering, we also do analysis and design for earthquake, okay? That is a different part in structural engineering and it needs some specialization. So we, you need to study structural dynamics, then you go for structural analysis and design for seismic loads and also for wind loads, 
etc. So that completes structural engineering topic briefly. Let us go to geotechnical engineering. Again, this is also one of the important branches in civil engineering. It is, it is as important as structural engineering. So whatever structure we construct, we have, we have to construct on earth. So whatever load the structure carries has to be transferred to the earth safely. For that, when we are supposed to know the properties of the soil underneath the building. So by knowing the properties, soil has different properties. By knowing these properties of the soil, we are going to find out what is the bearing capacity of the soil, how much load per unit area of the soil can carry. Okay, so to find out what is that value, what we do is we are going to go to the field, we are going to collect samples and we are going to bring the samples to the lab and we are going to conduct different tests on the soil. So after conducting different tests, so there are different properties, mainly C and phi, that is cohesion and internal friction properties, we are going to find out and we are going to find out what is the bearing capacity of the soil. But there may be some soil wherein it normally they may not be able to withstand the heavy load or whatever the load coming on the soil. And also the soil properties may vary according to the season. Say for example, if you take clay soil, so during rainy season it absorbs a lot of water and it expands enormously. During dry season, it shrinks. If you construct directly a structure on the clay soil, it leads to collapse of the structure or uneven settlement. That is, the structure may get tilted and also the structure may develop cracks. So in these kinds of structures, nobody wants to live in. So what we do is we are going to treat the soil. Treating that is, we are going to strengthen the existing soil from outside. Then afterwards, we are going to construct foundation on that. So again, we have different types of foundations. So depending on the requirement and depending on the load coming on the soil, we are going to construct different kinds of foundations. So in soft soil or in sandy soil, so as, and also the foundations in marine structures. So we use normally piles. So piles are nothing but the vertical members. It is like a pencil of different diameter and different lengths. Diameter, it may even vary from 150 millimeter up to 900 millimeter, huge pile. And the length may vary even up to 30 meters. Okay, we are going to drive those piles it is going to be like a pole into the soil and we are going to drive several piles into the soil. Okay, then over which we are going to construct the foundation on which we are going to put a structure. Okay, so again this is another branch of civil engineering which is very important and it has got wide application and also it has, still it is growing, okay. So if you want to construct a dam again, you need to do soil study, that is the nature of the soil. And if you are constructing an earthen dam, that is the dam using the soil, so what soil to be used, how much the soil to be compacted. So all those things we are going to study under soil mechanics or geotechnical engineering, okay? And we are going to construct a structure. Next comes hydraulics and water resources engineering. What is hydraulics? It is, it is a subject wherein we are going to study the properties of fluid. Here, when we say hydraulics, it is water. So water may be under two state, it is under static state 
or it is under dynamic state when it is moving. So when it is under static state, again it applies pressure. If you are constructing a dam and if you are storing water, so it is static. So it is going to apply pressure on the dam. So how much pressure the dam is going to get due to the water? Again, the pressure depends on how much water depth you are going to store. Okay? So that property we are going to study, how much, what is the pressure? And also if it is windy, then it is going to create ripples and it is going to, ripples are going to hit the dam. So they are also, ripples also going to cause additional pressure on the dam. So that should also be taken into consideration if you are building a dam. Okay? And in case of marine structures, so water will be again moving. We are getting waves. If you are constructing marine structures like docks, harbors, so all those water current forces will be taken into consideration. Okay? So that is under, that comes under water under motion. So again, if you are supplying water for drinking purpose or for irrigation purpose, so water will not be stagnant. It will be flowing. Okay? So when the water is flowing, then we are going to study different properties of the water when it is flowing. What kind of flow we have, like laminar flow, turbulent flow, and all those things. We are going to study under hydraulics. Okay, hydraulics is nothing but the, to study the properties of water when the water is static or when the water is moving. Okay, and water resources engineering. So water resources engineering is very important after knowing these properties of the properties of water, then we need to apply the knowledge of hydraulics under water resources engineering. So what resources, what are the resources for water? Lakes, ocean, rain, underground water, and we are going to make use of that water for irrigation purpose, drinking purpose, and any other industrial purpose, and all those things. So when we are constructing a city, for example, so their first thing we are going to construct is after the survey everything. So where can we get the water from? So where is the nearest source of water so that we can supply? If not at a feasible distance, do we have any water underground so that we can drill the water out through bore wells? So those things we are going to study under water resources engineering and once that is decided then we are going to estimate what how much water we need per person per day then depending on the population how much we are going to find out how much water we need then how to bring the water to this city so that is through pipes or through open canal to some distance then after water is brought so it should be purified and then it should be supplied, okay? Then if you are using water for irrigation purpose, so how much land to be irrigated, so how much water you need in every season, okay? What is the canal size you need? Again, depending on how many hectares of land you are going to irrigate. So all those things we are going to study under water resources engineering and also we are going to study how much rainfall a particular area gets in a particular season and we are going to measure the rainfall so that we can get the estimation of water coming to a particular reservoir. So these are the brief introduction about hydraulics and water resources engineering and so it is much more than what I am saying in 10 minutes. Okay. With that, I will go to the next transportation engineering and highway engineering. So transportation and highway engineering. See, for any city to develop, infrastructure is very important. So there are several infrastructures 
and very important infrastructures are roads, bridges, okay, and uh, waterways, airways, etc. So, if I take, say, for example, roads, for any city to develop, for in any, any industry to develop, the first thing they are going to look for is the communication. Communication in this sense, physical communication. How can we approach that city? If something is manufactured in, this, in that city, how we can export through roads? Do we have good communication? Do we have good railway lines? Okay, and how can we get raw materials? Is there anything available nearby? Or do we have to bring from far off places? So to bring all those things, do we have all those roads, proper roads? Do we have enough number of bridges? proper bridges and all those things. If not, so we are going to construct the roads, required roads and waterways and airports and all those things. And that part we are going to study under transportation and highway engineering. And again, under highway engineering we are going to study different types of roads. As you all know, now we have so many national highways and highways can be divided into several types, national highways, straight highways, district roads, minor roads and also major, major district roads, minor district roads and village roads. So depending on what ca category it belongs to, we will have different width of roads and we have different style of construction for these roads. Okay, uh, that, is, that is transportation engineering. Next comes environmental engineering. So nowadays, environmental engineering has gained importance. So before, initially environmental engineering means it was only public health engineering uh, that dealt with only water supply for drinking purpose for people and disposing the water, waste water that is a sanitary engineering. Only there were only two parts. As population grew, human needs also grew. So that affected the environment, the entire environment because of vehicle pollution, okay, more population, more demand for food. So as a result, more waste is generated because of use of different things to consume by the people. So this led to different environmental problems. We have air pollution, we have river pollution, that is water pollution and all those things. So environment deals with how to study these things, that is what are the effects of human habitat on the environment. So we are going to categorize and we are going to study related to environment like air pollution, solid waste management, so water supply, sanitary engineering. These are different branches of environmental engineering. Okay. So if you take air pollution, what are the causes of air pollution? Okay. So what are the pollutants in the air? How to take care of that? air pollution, that is how to reduce it. If we, if we cannot make it zero, of course, it is almost impossible to make it zero. So there will always be some pollutants. So we have to bring all those pollution to certain acceptable limit, okay? So in environmental engineering, we study that and also we take remedial measures to put the air pollution under control. That is applicable for even water we drink, okay? And also there is solid waste management. Again, we are, humans are producing lots of solid waste. So we are just collecting them and we are putting them in a ground, in an open ground that creates a lot of stench and also it is leading to different diseases 
okay, how to manage all those solid waste. So that is also a part of environmental engineering. Okay. With that, I am going to go to the next one, that is construction planning and project management. As I said, if you are constructing any structure, say for example, if it is a dam or a harbor or a multi-storied building, the first thing we do is, after conducting the survey, okay, we do analysis, we do design. After doing the design, we are going to prepare drawings, okay, and uh, you say, okay, these are the things we need. These are the things we need to construct. So once we have it, we are going to estimate what are, what is the cost involved, what are the materials required, okay, how long that this project is going to take to complete, okay, and how to start, what is the human resource need, how many engineers, how many labors, and how many people of different management level, and all those things we are going to estimate, okay, then we are going to prepare a construction schedule, okay, then we are going to implement the project gradually. So, starting from the supply of the material, excavating the soil, then constructing the foundation. So, initially how much material you need, say for example, how many bags of cement you need, how many tons of steel you need for foundation part. So, procure that material at an economical price. So, how many labors you need, how many engineers you need. So, all those things, then start construction. As the construction continues, what is the next level? So, what do we need for that? Okay, those things are planned. So, those things come under construction planning and project management. So, it is, again, it is a long and big branch of engineering, civil engineering, and it is very complex. It is not as easy as what I am explaining in five minutes. Just I try to give, try to give a brief introduction about construction planning and project management. So, in addition to seven branches of civil engineering, we have some more branches, so which I am not going to cover. So, I think this should be good enough. Thank you.